him for a few years now, and uh, Jeff Wobbleton, the operations chief at uh, the Office of Unified Communications in Washington, D.C. But it was, a, it was a very good presentation, especially to listen to these guys talk about how successful the, the program has been for them. So uh, as we go through this, and, and Brian mentioned to try to hold your questions until the end, uh, chances are that I will answer your questions as I go along with this presentation. So I would anticipate that there probably would be just a few questions maybe at the end, uh, but I, that's, I think that will work out well that way. So this is what I'm going to go over. I'm going to talk about the ASAP standard. Uh, we'll look at how it works, and I'll show you a video. The video is actually about three years old and uh, is in the process of uh, being reproduced, I understand, so that some of the numbers can be updated. But even so, it gives a pretty good overview of what the project is all about. We'll look to see what PSAPs are using it today. We actually have 27 PSAPs up at this and probably a, <laughs> an equal number in line that, that want to do it. Uh, that are waiting on the CAD vendors or waiting for the implementation. But we'll see that list. And we'll also look at the central stations that are currently participating and the ones that said that they will participate in the near future. Then we'll look at some numbers from the PSAPs that are using this and um, also hear about uh, central station experiences. One thing I will be covering in some detail uh, is the address verification process so that you'll understand how these addresses that are being delivered to the CAD system are pre-verified in advance before any alarms uh, come in for those addresses. I, I do have a recorded demo because it is Friday and the beginning of Labor Day weekend. It was um, a little bit difficult to try to find some one of my usual contacts at the alarm companies. They, they all seem to be off today, but of course, the rest of us are working. And then we will get into those questions and answers at the end. Uh, these are some acronyms. I think that all of you know what APCO is. Uh, you were there for the conference, obviously, in Denver. And uh, then we have ASAP, which is what we're talking about today. Now, the TMA is the Monitoring Association, and this is uh, formally known as the Central Station Alarm Association, or CSAA. So you'll still find a little bit of documentation here and there. Uh, even the standard itself, itself still refers to the uh, Central Station Alarm Association. So there's a lot of updates that have to be done because of that name change. NEAM is a technical standard. If those of you that are familiar with the teletype operation and the NCIC field identifiers, uh, you know that VCO stands for vehicle color. and uh, and uh, with NEEM, uh, it's set, the field identifier says vehicle color. Uh, so it's, it's in plain English uh, what defines the piece of data that it's wrapped around. Uh, this, this project is NEEM conformant. And if you and another agency went out for a Department of Justice grant money uh, to do a joint project together, then the end result has to be NEEM conformant if it's a technical project. Otherwise, they won't give you the grant money. NLIS, of course, is the message switch out in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, this traffic does ride across NLIS. It does use ORIs. And we'll see how that comes together in just a few minutes. And I think all of you know what a PSAP is. So let me pay, play for you, uh, and I'm going to hold my mic up kind of close to my speaker so you can hear this. Uh, but this is one of the typical problems um, every day across the country when alarm companies call the 911 piece app to make them aware of an alarm notification. So this is one of example of something that can uh, go wrong. Calling. I have a commercial burglary alarm. Oh, it's the, the burglary alarm in the mail on Carmel. Oh, what's the address? It is 2917 Honest Road. Okay, so that is MOS. And that's in the city of Richmond? Yes. Yeah. Oh, my
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point, um, but that was sad uh, that it took that long just to figure out where this alarm was. And what happened is the alarm operator did spell it correctly when the call taker asked, uh, but the alarm operator mispronounced the street and threw the call taker off. So the point about ASAP is, is that these conversations do not need to occur at all any longer. If people would just use the ASAP program, to deliver the alarms through the interface and use automation instead, you don't have to have these verbal conversations between the humans. It's all automated and it's very, very accurate. So let me go ahead and play this uh, uh, video that uh, was produced by the Central Station Alarm Association, now the Monitoring Association. And this is the one that's three years old, so some of the numbers are outdated. But uh, even so, I think that uh, you'll you'll get the gist of what uh, what it's all about. Hello, I'm Ed Barnabas, past president of the Central Station Alarm Association. And I'm Pam Petro, president and CEO at Vector Security. Pam and I are co-chairs of the ASAP Steering Committee. And we're here to tell you about the importance of the Automated Secure Alarm Protocol Program, known as ASAP. ASAP is a new initiative that reduces the overall call volume at 911 centers or PSAPs. It significantly reduces processing time and cuts the potential for errors and miscommunication. That means you can free up your call center resources for other tasks, and you can improve your ISO rating by increasing the speed of handling each call. I've been heavily involved in the ASAP program for many years now and have seen the benefits firsthand. Here at Vector, we've seen major benefits from the address and responding agency validation that occurs within the ASAP program, making sure that the correct agency is notified. We've also eliminated communication errors between Vector operators and the PSAP call takers. Our customers have benefited from reduced response time. The program is gaining traction. It's currently being deployed in Houston, Texas, Richmond, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Tempe, Arizona, and elsewhere. Because it's scalable, it can be rolled out effectively for any city of any size. Most importantly, the program enjoys the support of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the International Association of Fire Chiefs, the National Sheriff's Association, and of course our partner in the program, APTO International. This video will shed more light on the ASAP to PSAP program. Take a look and see how the program can benefit your city. Thanks for watching. City of Richmond is one of two PSAPs, policy financial points, that participate in the program. After analysis, we determined this program was worthwhile and an opportunity for us to provide excellent customer service to the citizens of Richmond. There's three primary goals. The first goal is to eliminate the telephone calls between the arm monitoring central stations and the 911 PSAP. The second goal is to eliminate or reduce the mistakes and miscommunications that can be made commonly between two human beings talking over the telephone. And the third goal is to reduce 911 processing time. If we can reduce 911 processing time by two to three minutes, that means a two to three minutes reduction in response times. 
when you call in an alarm to um, a 9 one center, depending on the day and time that line, the operator could be waiting on her because of the volume of calls they're handling in 9 one center. Then once they get the operator on, they have to provide the name, address, and location of the alarm. So what could possibly go wrong is the operator transposes two digits in a street address to the wrong street address. Possibly in some cities we've seen with the same street name, like Main Street and Main Drive. If they provide street or drive, police are going to have to go into the wrong place. And the same street name, depending on the community and the area, the pronunciation of the street could be completely different. Now, ASAP takes the human errors out of the transaction, so you can't make all those mistakes. What ASAP does is take away the need to ask any questions about an alarm activation. Instead, all the data that that call taker who normally has by telephone comes in to the CAD system and is processed as a call for service. All of the data that a call taker would have asked, and even more, is populated in that call for service and provides the first responders all the details that they need to know. The whole process takes a matter of about five seconds. The Houston Emergency Center is the fourth largest call center in the United States. We answer 3.2 million phone calls per year. Of those 3.2 million phone calls we answer per year, we dispatch about 1.3 million police units to calls for service. And then we dispatch another half million fire ambulance assets to calls for service on the fire side. 70% of phone calls we receive come in the 911 line. 30% come in on the 10 digit line or the non emergency line. The non emergency line is where all those alarm calls come in. Now, we right now, with a small footprint of four alarm companies, have reduced call volume between 10 and 12% as far as phone calls come in. And we predict that we could probably reduce another 50% on top of that if we had all the big players on board. I think the unexpected benefits are that the officers don't have to talk to dispatchers as much as far as finding out who is the key holder, what's their phone number, the name of the alarm company, what's their phone number. They can handle that all themselves while they with the dispatcher. The officers in the field and the public safety responders love this program because of the precise information quickly and it has, provides the citizens immediate services. This program is a phenomenal program. It works. When you look at next generation technologies, you have to look at something that has a proven track record and something like this program that helps you provide excellent customer service to citizens you serve. Them. Okay, and I should have mentioned before I started that video that uh, there was going to be a latency issue. Uh, we didn't have any control over that, but uh, the, the audio sounded pretty good. Uh, we know that the audio was not, uh, or the video was not keeping up well with the audio, but uh, if you heard the audio and, and if you were at this, if you visited the CSA, you, you probably have one of the DVDs that has that video on it, so you can play it. And also, we'll we'll get you a copy of this if you don't have it. Uh, so this became an American national standard after a two and a half year pilot project. The pilot started in July of uh, 20, 2006, and uh, we did run it for two and a half years. It was so successful that it was pushed immediately through the APCO ANS process and became an American national standard on January the 15th, 2009. APCO likes to renew all the standards no less often than every five years, and this one was renewed in August of 2014. So we'll be rolling up on another renewal before too much longer with some enhancements, of course. If you look at the 22,800,000 number, that's the number of times, the number of telephone calls that the alarm central stations are placing to the PSAPs each year to report an alarm notification. But that figure does not include the number of times that they call you back to report, uh, to request a cancellation, or they might tell you that it really is a crime in progress. Uh, you might need to call them to ask for a key holder, and uh, the, the calls can easily add up. Uh, sometimes they'll call you back to, to ask you what happened at the scene, and uh, you know, and I think all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, you can easily multiply this number by about three, and that's the average number of times for every alarm uh, telephone call-wise that are being placed between the PSAP and the central station. 
and that is the number of telephone calls that we can potentially eliminate if we can get everybody to participate in the ASAP program. So the alarm central station, when they get an alarm notification in, they still have to do what is required by local or state ordinance or even by their own rules. And what I mean by that is, in Virginia, all alarm companies are regulated by the Department of Criminal Justice Services. And that department says for all residential burger alarms, the alarm companies have to try to make contact with two people. It's only after they've exhausted that effort and have not been able to make contact with two people, one person, that they can go ahead and hand it off to the 911 center, but they do have to go through those motions. The ASAP program does not relieve them of any responsibility whatsoever. They still have to do those things. So if that's required by your state or your local ordinance, and even ADT and vector security, by company policy, they still do enhanced call verification in an effort to reduce the number of false alarms. So if Mrs. Smith just walked out of her house and she left a little puppy inside and the puppy sets off a motion detector, the alarm company is going to get the alarm and they'll call Mrs. Smith, who's now about two blocks away, and, and Mrs. Smith, uh, your alarm's going off at your house. Uh, is everything okay? And she'll say, oh, I left the dog inside, and he set off the motion detector, so uh, please do not do not notify the police. It's okay. Now, it's those type of situations that you never hear about in the PSAP because the alarm companies have done their job, and they were able to filter this event to know that it really was a false alarm and, and you don't receive it. But when they're not able to make contact with somebody, or if they have reason to believe that it really is a, a crime in progress, of course, you're going to get notified in the peace at then. So at that point, the alarm companies now hit, uh, the, the ones that are participating in the program, they hit what they call the easy button, and all the information that's associated <clears throat> with the alarm and the address uh, comes into the CAD system. The CAD system will do two things first. It will look at the address and it will also look at the event type. The address, and I mentioned this earlier, the address has to be pre-verified between the alarm company and the PSAP, and that is an automated process. I've got more slides that explain that process, but that has to be done. The alarm company cannot send an alarm for an address that has not already been pre-validated. Then there's also a standardized list of event types. Uh, there's about 35 to 40 different event types that the alarm company can send. And in your CAD system, you will have a translation table. So let's say that the alarm company sends uh, something called a, uh, a reset or a tamper. And if you want that translated to a burger alarm, you can certainly do that in your CAD system. So all the CAD providers have this translation table and it is one of the requirements of the program. So the CAD system will do a lookup on the address and the event type. Now, if anything's wrong with either one of those, the CAD system will send a message back to the alarm company that says, reject it, this is a bad address, or this is a bad event type. And you do not, see that happen in the PSAP, this is being done behind the scenes. And the alarm company will get that message back and then they'll have to deal with it. <clears throat> if everything's okay with the address and the event type, then the CAD system will create a call for service. And the call for service will be routed to one or more appropriate dispatch positions, depending on how your P SAP is structured. So I'll use Richmond, which I'm, I'm very familiar with. I worked there for 43 years. I uh, just retired yesterday. Uh, I'm mean, going back part time so that I can uh, finish up some things there, but this will allow me to spend more time on the ASAP program. But I am intimately familiar with how Richmond is structured. And we have four police precincts. We have uh, a couple of fire dispatch positions, and then there's the secondary PSAP, which is the Ambulance Authority. 
So if the alarm that comes in is, is let's say, a law, a law enforcement alarm, then the CAD system is going to check the address and uh, go ahead and create a call for service and send that call to the appropriate police dispatch position. We have four of those, one for each precinct. It will show up in the open call queue at that dispatch position for dispatch. Now, if you envision where a call taker is taking a call from an alarm company over the telephone and all their information is being entered into the CAD system uh, and then they, they finish that entry and they hit, uh, in our case, the accept button and then it shows up at the appropriate police dispatch position, it's no different with it coming from the alarm company except in this case it is coming from the alarm company. So just think in terms of a call taker putting their information in and it gets routed to a dispatch position. The same thing happens with the alarm notifications from the alarm companies. So if it's a fire alarm, we're going to dispatch the fire department and we're going to send a police officer for the traffic control. So a fire alarm will actually be routed to the fire dispatch position for dispatch and to the appropriate police channel for dispatch of a police officer for traffic control. If it's a medical alarm, all three disciplines are going to be dispatched. So you control this, of course, through your response plans, and then it's also, uh, you can control this through the translation table too. So one thing that comes in is the alarm company's incident number. Now, if everything's okay with that address and event type, then when the CAD system creates the call for service, it will send what we call an accept message back to the alarm company. And it will say, accept it, and this is our incident number, um, and here's your incident number. So now you have a cross between the, the alarm company's incident number and the PSAP's incident number. And they get that message back, and they know that the PSAP now has that alarm notification and it's been accepted by the CAD system and they're going to go ahead and make a dispatch on it. So then as things happen, let's say um, that once uh, the first unit is dispatched of the primary agency, uh, such as a police officer for a police type of alarm, then the CAD system knows this behind the scenes without any additional workload on the dispatch staff and will send a message to the alarm company that says police has been dispatched. Or if it's a sheriff's department, it will say law has been dispatched. If it's a fire alarm, it will say fire has been dispatched and so forth. When the first unit arrives on the scene, the CAD system will pick up on that again with no additional workload on the part of the dispatch staff and it will know hey, this is the first unit to arrive on the scene for this alarm event. So the CAD will send a message to the alarm company that says police are on scene or law is on scene or fire is on scene. Now we can get into what you might want to think as a, as a chat scenario or a messaging feature. So the alarm company, when they have new information to provide to you, a lot of times it's a request for a cancellation. They can send that to the CAD system it will show up as a new update or a new comment, depending on how your CAD system calls it. But again, think in terms of your call takers that are answering the telephones and the alarm company calls them on the telephone and says, hey, uh, please cancel this response. We made contact with the key holder and, uh, and they gave us the proper code and everything's okay. So, Think in terms of that, where they enter that information into the CAD, it gets routed to the police or to the dispatch positions. The same thing happens here, except this is coming in uh, from, from the alarm company directly into the CAD system. No telephone call involved. It's very, very quick. And it shows up as a new update to this call for service. Now, I'm very familiar with, with many different CADs out there, and I know that most of them have some type of audi audible and visual indication when you have a new update come in for a call for service. So the same situation happens here. You you might need to, your, your dispatch staff that are working on the radio, you could even uh, do this from the police officer mobile data computers. 
uh, allow them to send a message to the alarm company that says, hey, I need a key holder to respond. Please provide an ETA. The alarm company will get that request, and they'll respond back to it and let you know who's responding and how soon they're there. But you can ask them anything in the world that you need to. And finally, when they call it, when all the units have cleared from the scene, once again, the CAD system picks up on that information and will send a message to the alarm company that says uh, the call has been closed, and by the way, here's the dispositions. Now, not in every case you'll have a disposition, because I know that our fire apparatus in Richmond do not provide dispositions, uh, so in this case, it would simply be that the call is closed. But of course, our police officers do provide dispositions, and uh, in that case, the call would be closed and would also reflect what the dispositions are. Now, somebody always asks, uh, expresses a concern, can the alarm companies see other notes that have been added to the call for service? And my answer is no, they cannot. They can only see what you intend for them to receive, the information that you deliberately send to them uh, through uh, some sort of trigger. So it, like in the case, and you'll see how this works in a few months when I show you the demo, but like on the InterGraph system, we use a pound pound ahead of the, the comment. And the CAD system knows that, hey, here's a pound pound, so I need to send this message to the alarm company, as well as add it as a comment uh, to the call for service. Uh, so also, all the responses coming in from the alarm company become part of that permanent record as well for the call for service. <clears throat> so this is just recapping the three goals of the project, and the first goal is to eliminate the telephone calls between the alarm company and the 911 PSAP. So the second goal, and you remember I played that really bad uh, conversation between the Richmond call taker and the alarm company at the beginning of the presentation. We want to eliminate that. We want to eliminate people that can't understand the conversation. We want to not eliminate the people, but eliminate the conversations between the people that can't understand each other. So I like to use the analogy of where we got some uh, alarm operator in Brooklyn, New York, trying to talk to a call taker down in Mississippi. And oftentimes, just because of the difference in accents, the conversation is not going to go all that well. But some of these central stations are also using uh, call centers now in foreign continents, and it's even harder to understand the people. But why have to have these conversations at all when we can use automation instead? So we have an opportunity to de decrease 911 processing time. We can turn that into a decrease in response time. And, and somebody says, well, suppose you don't have the resources available. Well, you have to have your resources available in order to be able to dispatch them. So if your resources are available, you can turn that reduction of 911 processing time also into a reduction in response times too that will increase the likelihood of law enforcement apprehensions. And there have been documented cases where the police really have gotten to the scene of a crime because of this program very quickly and have made apprehension in burglaries and holdups. It's happened in Richmond, it's happened in Houston, it's also happened in Washington, D.C., and I would guess in other places too. Uh, fires more quickly extinguished. If the fire department arrives on the scene anywhere from a minute and a half to three minutes sooner, then that means that uh, they stand a better chance of extinguishing that fire with minimum property damage uh, versus rolling up later on a fully engulfed situation. And for the medical emergency patient, this can mean the difference between life and death for them. So I want to play for you now uh, the conversation, and uh, on the bottom line, it's a call being taken through the ASAP program. I've actually had to slow this down a little bit so you can read the words come up because it's very, very fast. And uh, the, the top 
uh, row would be the traditional method, uh, taking it by telephone. And as you hear this conversation, just listen to the call taker uh, typing away on the keyboard in the CAD system. I mean, he's really burning this keyboard up and uh, and just, just going uh, hog wild. Uh, he does a good job, but even so, just, just compare the time difference. much a normal call. There's a lot of information that he did not ask for. He did not ask for detailed directions to the address. Now in Richmond, we're kind of landlocked at this point. But, you know, in some areas, if you're in charge of a county PSAP, uh, you do have houses that sit a half a mile to a mile off the road. And sometimes directions to the house is beneficial to the responders. So he didn't ask for that information. But the point is, if the alarm company has that information, it's going to become part of that call for service. Also, he did not ask what color is the building. If the alarm company has that information, if it's a red brick building, it will become part of the call for service. If it's, uh, he did not ask for what is the building used for, suppose it was a gun shop, wouldn't that be important information? Again, if the alarm company has that information, it's going to come in and it's going to become part of that call for service. So in Richmond, we've had 49,000 of these so far since day one. And I'm thinking back to August 2011 when we had the earthquake. This is the one that damaged the Washington Monument. Well, that sucker was centered about 40 miles away from downtown Richmond. And I remember it well when I was in the city hall and the building shook. And after we evacuated, we, we didn't really understand what was going on until we saw all the other buildings being evacuated as well, so we knew what, what it was at that point. Where I'm going with this is that day, we had six call takers on duty to answer 16 incoming 911 trunks. There was nobody left, and this is the same group of people that answer the non-emergency lines when the arm companies call in. We didn't have anybody left to answer the abundance of 911 calls, much less the non-emergency calls. So that day, for at least a two-hour period, the alarm companies that were trying to call in by telephone did not get an answer, period. But the ones that used ASAP to deliver their alarms uh, through the ASAP program, it was business as usual, no slowdowns whatsoever. And then we had Hurricane Irene a few, four days later, uh, we were prepared for that. We knew it was coming, and we had uh, 12 call takers on duty to, to uh, sit in that 12 answering positions. Uh, but even so, we still had 16 incoming trunks to answer. So at times during the storm, uh, we, we just did not have enough call takers. It, it was the same situation. So as a former communication officer, I will attest to you that that I absolutely hated taking a call by telephone from an alarm company. 
Uh, a lot of a lot of us felt it was the worst call you could possibly take into PSAP, but with the ASAP program, it's now become the most accurate and concise call that you can take. Um, we know what's going on down in Houston. It just so happens that that Houston uh, carries a big impact uh, on the ASAP program. Uh, they were an early adopter of it. Uh, my hat is off to uh, Dave Cutler, and uh, especially, you know, we're all thinking what, about them and what's going on. Uh, I've, I've conveyed my best wishes to them, and I have communicated with them. Uh, ASAP was offline for about two days. Uh, it is back online down there now, but uh, you, you all know the situation. Uh, but as we heard in the news, they are the fourth largest metropolitan uh, metropolis in the United States. But going to the next page, um, what really stands out is that on March the 22nd, 2016, ADP joined the ASAP program with Houston, and they called me up uh, that day before 24 hours had even expired. And he said, Bill, he said, he said, ADT is delivering more alarms to us through the ASAP program than all the other alarm companies put together. And he just really thought that this was great. And that's a picture of their center. Uh, Washington, D.C. has had uh, great success. Uh, they, they did come up, uh, another early adopter of this. And uh, let's go on to the next page where I'm going to show you some stats, uh, but you can see in the right graph where in 2015, it was actually December the 1st, 2015, that ADT joined up with uh, Washington, D.C., and you can see what happened after that. It just like in 2016, they went from, from 9,700 and some calls to over 27,000, and for this year, we do project that uh, they'll hit almost 30,000. And if you look at the leftmost graph, uh, you see that in Washington's case that almost 80% of their calls are burger alarms and business alarms, and then uh, fire is almost 10%. Uh, they do have a pretty high ratio, in my opinion, of medical alarms. It used to be less than 1%, and now it's uh, it's over 2%. So we're seeing this as a uh, kind of a nationwide trend that there are more medical alarms. And I think all of you know the reason for that because uh, the, the medical alarm business is starting to become really, really big. And then hold up and panic alarms was about 8.5%. Now, what do these figures really mean to anybody? Uh, it just means that this is what's happening in Washington. Uh, this breakdown is completely different for another locality, so uh, it's just just kind of shows you what's happening at that particular locality. Uh, Tempe, Arizona, I'm really not going to talk about uh, for the sake of time, so I'm going past them. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, Monroe County and uh, Klinger up there. Uh, John uh, Merkinger pushed really hard to get New York State to open up their message switch. He, he worked on them for a period of about two years. Uh, he kept lobbying uh, at a political level, and uh, he finally got it. Uh, he got that switch open, and Rochester and Monroe County came on board with ASAP at the end of April of this year, and already uh, just at that at this time, with just two alarm companies on, they had, um, or actually four, um, they've had some good results. So you see here, uh, you look at the Pac-Man there, and you see some numbers that are entirely different from Washington, D.C., percentage-wise. Uh, but the neat thing is, is that they've already had one hold-up alarm that resulted in an arrest. Uh, they had uh, two fire alarms that uh, were actual fires, and, and they were quickly extinguished by the fire department because of a quick response. And uh, they also had a medical alarm that uh, did result in uh, earlier preparation. Uh, what I want to mention about James City County is back in December of 2012 is when they went live. One week before they went live, one of their call takers took a call from Vector Security and the call taker transposed the street number. The police responded to the wrong address. 
They went in with guns drawn, found the homeowner asleep in his bed who happened to be a former Marine, and he had a pistol under his pillow. Now you're thinking, oh, geez, something really bad happened here. Well, no, nobody got hurt. It was just a big embarrassment for the PSAP. And uh, the PSAP director had to write the hardest letter of her career to explain to that homeowner why uh, police were dispatched to the wrong address. Uh, ASAP will help to prevent that type of problem. And she also said, by the way, she said if we had had ASAP a week earlier, this would not have happened. And she's correct, because Vector Security was the first alarm company to go live with James City County. Uh, so we all know that, uh, I know that uh, in Richmond we have staffing shortages. Uh, we do the, the hiring blitzes. Uh, we we uh, run a 14-week dispatch academy. And what do we do? We graduate them, then we start the hiring blitzes again. It's like a never-ending cycle. Um, and I suspect that a lot of you are in the same situation. We know that next generation 911 is coming along, may even stretch our resources further, but ASAP is a way to free up some of those resources and let the automation handle these exchanges between the arm companies and the PSAPs instead of having to do this over the telephone. So ASAP is an ANSI standard. It is one size fits all. Uh, no matter how small or large the agency, it's my contention this would be of most benefit for a one or two position PSAP uh, where you've got that head on accident and you've got 25 callers trying to call it in and and you don't have the people to be able to process all those telephone calls and you know quickly and then you've got that alarm company trying to call it in. Uh, but this will also work for New York City too and New York City is currently looking at it. It is not vendor specific, and we'll look at the CAD vendors in just a minute to see who's who's developed a solution for it. Uh, so these are the operational peace apps today. Uh, Newport News, Virginia, was the most recent to come on board. Uh, we're currently we're getting ready to bring up uh, Sarasota uh, County, Florida, in another week, and uh, Union County, North Carolina, in about three weeks. And uh, we have a few of them that are in line, They're just uh, waiting for their cab vendor to finish the installations. But this list really has literally doubled in the past year and a half. Uh, here's your CAD provider list that have a solution. So the first commercial CAD provider was Intergraph and, and had a solution. And uh, just a little story behind that, I had written the first CAD system in Richmond uh, it was a it was a homegrown system, and uh, it was used for 26 years before the hardware manufacturer went out of business. So we had to replace it with something. And when we did our RFP, we said that well, the new CAD system has to do everything that the old CAD system does. Well, included in that was the ASAP program. It was actually called something different back in that day, but. Uh, Intergraph was charged with making, reproducing it and uh, continuing, continuing it on. Uh, you see here we have Northrop Grumman, Versaterm. Uh, we have Securion, which was formerly a SunGuard, uh, Motorola for their Premier One CAD system, uh, of our public safety, uh, Tower with their New World platform, and uh, also TriTech. Uh, I understand that TriTech will be developing this for one or two other platforms as well. Okay, so here is where I get on my soapbox about the addresses and, and how this is done. So the, uh, when you start to work, when you sign up for this program, uh, you'll, you'll be working with a consultant. You have to do that. Uh, that is a requirement of the Monitoring Association. The consultant will work with you, will work with the CAD vendor, will work with the alarm companies to coordinate everything. The consultant will call in, do a solicitation to the alarm companies, anywhere from eight to 10 alarm companies initially, uh, and they will say, uh, okay, this PSAP is getting ready to to uh, start the, or, or is, ready, is almost ready to implement ASAP, uh, so please go ahead and send in your address list. They will send in all the addresses for all the addresses that they monitor in your locality. 
and then we'll add some columns to that spreadsheet uh, that will allow you to record corrections. And then you will be given those spreadsheets uh, and you can go through or have somebody go through and make corrections. So yes, you will find a lot of street names that are spelled wrong. You will find where alarm companies are currently calling your PSAV for an alarm system in another state somewhere, or they might be calling that other state for alarms for addresses in, in your locality. There really hasn't been anything up to this point before ASAP came along to hold the alarm companies accountable for their data. I mean, some of the data I have seen it has been in really, really bad shape because it's so old and they just been, have not been held to any standard. Uh, some of the alarm companies' data, some alarm companies more than others, their data is very, very good because they've used a third-party service uh, to help them resolve any discrepancies in their data. But the ASAP program uh, kind of brings all this together. And, and so we get those address lists. And if you have somebody that's good at GL, GIS, uh, they can take your MSAG or take your G, GIS data and they can run a, a geocode process uh, to flush out the problems on the spreadsheet and very quickly at that if they know how to do things like that. Uh, and then you can just write down your corrections on the spreadsheet. The alarm company gets the spreadsheet back and they will go ahead and make the corrections. And then the day comes that we're ready for production. So the next thing that happens is now they've already tested with you. They, they will test with you in a test environment. And then uh, you have to sign off a letter, what we call a traffic authorization letter, that says, okay, uh, we work we work with ADT and uh, we're satisfied that uh, everything's lovely with the testing and uh, that they're going to do a good job for us. And we therefore authorize them to, to go into production with our agency. That letter has to be on file before the ASAP service will allow ADT to send you anything. Uh, so this is the formal part of the process and uh, that has to be done for every alarm company. Now, is it difficult? Absolutely not. It's a, it's a template. Uh, you just fill in the blanks. Uh, but they definitely do not do want a, a signature on file that you are satisfied that they have tested, and the consultant will make sure that this happens too, that they have tested properly and uh, that they're good to go. And then we'll so advise you that they're ready to be signed off. Uh, so the day will come that they get moved to, into production, and then the the alarm companies, one by one, this will, this will be controlled. Uh, they will send all of the addresses that they monitor in your locality to your CAD system for a final address verification check. And the CAD system will check every address and respond back to the alarm company. Yep, this one's good, this one's good. Nope, something wrong with this one and the ones that still come back rejected, then the alarm companies will have to take a second look at it, and they might need your help in taking that second look. But I'm just telling you that once they go through this process that I've described for you over the past three or four minutes, uh, there should be very few uh, rejections when they get to the what we call the bulk address validation process. And those those addresses will not come in to your CAD system any faster than one every 10 seconds. So <clears throat> there has been no CAD system that's been overwhelmed because of this, because the messages are throttled. Now, when ADT goes out tomorrow and installs a new alarm system at the city of Richmond, then their automation automatically takes the address that's entered into their database and it says, oh, gee, this is in the city of Richmond, and that's an ASAP agency. Uh, so it automatically sends a single address validation request to the city of Richmond PSAP CAD system, and the CAD system will respond. The neat thing is that these responses, these lookups by the CAD system, it's all transparent to the dispatch floor. They, they don't know that this is going on. So it's really, really neat. It's happening behind the scenes. Okay. So the event types, um, I, I mentioned earlier about the translation table. 
first of all, you decide what, what it is that you'll allow the arm companies to send. We do have some PSAFs. We have a couple of people, a couple of agencies out in Arizona uh, that are only doing police. That would be Tempe and Chandler. Uh, so the arm companies know this because when they're introduced with you and they start working with you, and, and the consultant moderates that conversation, then they will know right up front that all you accept is law enforcement alarms. Or in most cases, it's all three disciplines. Uh, there are some exceptions where one PSAP just does law and fire, but not EMS. But this is all defined during those conversations at the introductory stage when the alarm companies start to, to work with you. And I did mention about the, you know, a tamper alarm, if it came in as like a tamper alarm from the alarm company, can be translated to a burger alarm, or you can translate it however you want, because those tools are put in your control by the CAD vendors. Okay. We also talked about call verification and enhanced call verification that that has to be done by the alarm companies for certain types of alarms, and they're not relieved of that responsibility because of this program. These are the central stations that are currently operational with, PSAP, with ASAP. So we've got a lot of national companies here. We've got Vector, uh, Rapid Response is huge, Monotronics, Guardian, uh, Protection One, which is actually part of ADT now, but they still have a separate still run a separate system affiliated uh, with ADT goes without saying you know they are just huge uh, we have Stanley Vivin and uh, some others listed there now here is the alarm companies that said that they will be coming on board at some point in the future uh, so I will tell you that uh, Tyco uh, Tyco, I am currently testing with them, and they are due to go live with Richmond uh, the second week in September. Uh, Richmond is always the first piece I have to go live with each alarm company. Why is that? Because uh, Richmond was the original pilot site, and uh, they, the alarm companies also get certified. There's a certification process that they go through, so I do that, and uh, it's a fun process. But uh, one of the, the benefits of, of that process is uh, when it's all done and they're certified, then uh, they get to come up in Richmond. Now, if they don't have any alarms here, uh, they're still certified, but we will move them to a PSAP where they do monitor alarms. <clears throat> uh, it's won a, a lot of awards. I'm not going to bore you with that slide. Uh, this is how it all hooks together. Uh, we have the central stations that are connected to a message broker that's managed by the Monitoring Association. That message broker is housed in the same room with the MLS message switch in Phoenix, Arizona. Of course, it's a secure facility. It's environmentally controlled. It's just great uh, for computer equipment. And they have a, a disaster recovery site in Kentucky as well. <clears throat> now, the purpose of the message broker is when a message comes in from an alarm company, let's say it's ADT, and it, the, the message broker will look at the ORI on the message, and it says, uh, okay, this is for uh, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, is Richmond, Virginia and ADT authorized? Has Richmond, Virginia signed that traffic authorization form I was talking about earlier? If they have, then life is good, and the message broker sends the message on through. And it only takes a fraction of a section, second to do that. The MLS message switch uh, takes a look at the message, and uh, since it is ORI-based, it sees the VA that begins the ORI and will send it to Virginia. Virginia looks at the ORI and says, oh, this is the Richmond CAD system, and we'll send it on into Richmond. And then any messages coming back out of the Peace app will take the reverse route from left to right. So all the messages, those of you that keep up with the inlets message keys, uh, the message keys for incoming traffic from the alarm companies starts out with an ALQ message, and the uh, responses coming back out of the, the CAD system has an ALR message. Of course, that's uh, required 
uh, by inlets to be able to, to deliver the messages, but also to make sure that uh, your particular ORI has the right permissions to be able to deliver that type of traffic and receive it. This is the current state uh, map of the United States that shows the readiness of all the states. Uh, so we have several states that are in production. Uh, we have several states that are about to go to production, which would include Illinois, Tennessee, and South, um, actually Georgia. Um, and then uh, the other states that are blue, uh, they're ready, actually. Their message, is switch, message switches are capable. Uh, it's just that the, the state representative is waiting for a peace app to come along and say, hey, we really want to do this. Uh, let's make it happen. So what happens when there's a failure? We all know that inlets goes down occasionally, not too often, but there are times your state switch goes down, your CAD system goes down, uh, there might be a communications problem between any of two of these. And if the alarm company, the alarm company's automation is set up, if they do not receive a response from the PSAP within 60 seconds, then bells and whistles start to go off at the alarm company. And it says, hey, we haven't received a response from Richmond. The alarm operator goes to plan B, and they do call in the alarm by telephone at that point. Now, when everything comes back up, maybe two hours later, once the systems are restored, uh, then you're going to have messages that are old that are going to be coming in. So the CAD system is also programmed to look at the timestamp on every message. And if that alarm is older than 60 seconds, it will reject the, the alarm and say that it's too old and it will send that back to the alarm company. But this is your check and balance. So two hours earlier, earlier the alarm operator called it in by telephone, and then two hours later, when all systems are up, the CAD simply rejects the alarm because it's too old. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show you a demo. Uh, I actually did this live at uh, in Denver, but uh, I just didn't have anybody, like I said, I could get a hold of today to do this. So what's the next best thing is to show you a recorded demo. Uh, this is the Intergraph system at Richmond and also Vector Security. So let me get that started. Good day, audience. My name is Ben Hockwood, Project Manager for the IT Public Safety Team at the City of Richmond, Virginia. Joining us today is Anita Ostrowski. Vice President of Central Station Services for Vector Security. Anita is based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Anita, say hello. Hello. Today, we are going to demonstrate the effectiveness and efficiency of the ASAP program. I am currently attached to a live computer aided dispatch or CAD workstation at the City of Richmond's primary public safety answering point, also known as 911 PSAP or Emergency Communications Center. On this workstation, we can see some of the windows that telecommunicators use to perform their work. Included on this monitor are an event information window used to display details about a call to service, a pending events window used to list calls for service in queue awaiting dispatch, a unit resource window, and a map window. I will play the role of the telecommunicator assigned to dispatch police incidents for police precinct number two. In the role of alarm central station operator, Anita will now initiate a burglar alarm notification to the virtual PSAP. The CAD system will receive the message verified that the address is a valid city of Richmond address, that the event type is a valid event type, and generate a call to service by adding an entry to the pending events window where my cursor is in priority order. The CAD system will then send a response back to the alarm central station, letting them know that a call to service has been generated. We see that Anita just sent us the alarm signal to 3516 North Road, and before anybody else dispatches this, I'm going to dispatch it to Unit 913. 
Uh, Anita, did you receive the accept message from Richmond? Yes, I received the accept message. Okay. And I did this badge of police unit on the event. Did you receive a CAD update message from Richmond, and what did it tell you? Um, yes, I received the update, and the police has been dispatched. Okay. Now, the event information window uh, contains placeholders for the location, the type of the event, uh, also the, the planet's name, which in this case is the alarm company, and their telephone number. Um, and any information that uh, there's not a placeholder for will appear in the remarks window where I'm scrolling. Uh, we, we see the full address, uh, also whether the alarm is audible or silent, uh, exactly where was the trigger point for the alarm, uh, the alarm operators, uh, name ID, and also the uh, central station ID, any directions to the facility, and uh, perhaps a description of what the facility looks like, in this case, a three-story brown brick building. So 913 wasn't very far away on this call, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, mark 913 and arrive on the scene. Uh, and we can see in the map, not only the outline of the premises, but we can also now see that 913 is there. Uh, Anita, did you receive a message that the police had arrived? Yes, I received a message. It says, the police is on me. Okay, very good. So, in this scenario, the police have checked the outside perimeter of the structure. We can find no signs of forced entry or any unsecured doors or windows. A key holder will need to respond to allow the police to search the interior. The telecommunicator assigned to the dispatch channel or even the police officer from their mobile data computer, also called an MBC, can initiate a message to the alarm operator, as I will now demonstrate. So we go to this area right here. And I just entered the question premises is secure, please provide an ETA for the key holder. And now I'm sending uh, that message to Anita, which she should already have. And Anita, did you receive that message I sent? I did receive the message. The status is secure. Please provide an ETA for the key holder. Okay. And now Anita is going to prepare a response to that question and then return it back to me. Okay. And we have a response back that Mary Brown is ETA. Uh, in 15 minutes, and you see that that stands out in a different color and is bold. And if there's any need for the alarm company to send us additional information, that's, this is exactly how it would appear, such as we verify that there's an actual time in progress or uh, a request to cancel. So once the key holder has survived and the building has been searched and the premises declared secure, the police officer will clear from the event and reported this position. Once the last officer clears, the CAD system will send a message back to the alarm central station declaring that the event has been closed and will report the disposition back to the alarm company if the disposition is available. So I'm going to clear the event came from this event, and I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to enter a disposition code, and we're going to let Anita tell us what I entered. So, Anita, you should get a CAD update message back letting you know that the event has been closed, and I'd like for you to tell us what disposition I used. I did receive the update, and there's no cause for application. Very good. I do want to point out that the ASAP program is based on an American national standard. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Uh, so this is how to participate in the ASAP program. Uh, first of all, uh, if you looked at that state map and, and made a, a visual note uh, whether your state is actively participating or not, uh, if you're in a state that uh, they are not participating yet, uh, it would be it would behoove you to contact your state and let's rep uh, to make that interest known. And uh, also uh, contact your, your CAD provider now. You saw the CAD systems, the, the, the CAD providers, they do have a solution. Uh, so if they do have a solution today, you'll want to contact your account manager to, to get a quote 
what it's going to take to do this. If you didn't see your CAD system listed in that list, then contact your account manager and say, hey guys, when are you going to do this? You know, we really like this. Um, and also go online at the uh, the URL that you see there. And uh, Brian wanted me to make sure I emphasize this, uh, but we would like for you to, to go to this link and just fill out a short questionnaire. Uh, and you can see it there on the screen, the, the tma.us. Uh, ASAP dash contact dash us. Yeah, I'll, and, I'll uh, go ahead and send it out real quick to uh, everybody who's on the call. Okay, great. Uh, and then you do have to have that consultant. Uh, that is not negotiable. Uh, that is a new requirement as of October of 2016. Uh, we did have a couple of piece apps that went out and tried to do this themselves. Uh, it just did not go well. It was messy. They're still not up to date, and we don't want to have something like that happen again. So we want uh, we want a smooth transition for everyone that's trying to implement this. And that is my last slide. So Brian, I guess we're ready for some questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? If someone wants to raise their hand or ask, or you can type the question. Anyone? Does everyone know how to raise their hand in GoToWebinar? <laughs> oh, um, here's one from Lauren. What is the associated cost? For the consultant. Is that correct? Let's see if she writes back. Hold on a second. Tell you what, I will uh, go back a couple of slides here. There we go. Um, so I, I can't tell you what the cost would be for your CAD system. I have a general idea of what, what most of them are charging, and it's all over the board. Um, some of them are, are, are more than reasonable. And some of them are very expensive. It just depends on what CAD system you have. Uh, the the amount for the consultant is generally consistent, although for larger agencies it may cost a little bit more. But on average, um, the the cost could run about uh, five thousand dollars to have a consultant do a forty-hour gig uh, plus travel expenses. But if you're in New York City. That doesn't apply to you. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. Don, do you mind actually? Do you have a microphone? Maybe I'll just go ahead and unmute you. Or go ahead and uh, go ahead, Don. You're actually live. Hi. Is the uh, California switch issue been resolved? You know, the, the California, I kept contact you know, about three or four years ago. I, I kept sending messages to the California Inlet, Inlet's rep, and uh, finally she said that uh, it, that the switch was configured, I, I think, just to get me to stop sending her messages. But uh, if that's true, and, and I don't have any reason to believe it's not true, uh, in California, of course, we have an extra layer of complexity. And that is that you have uh, you have the localities that have to connect to a county switch, and then the county switch connects to the state switch. So there's an extra hop there. Um, but even so, it's not something that uh, is completely out of the question. It just means that you've got one added layer of uh, step there, that one extra hop that uh, the traffic has to go through. It's no reason in the world that it should not work. Uh, we're just waiting for some agency in California to step up and say that they're ready to do this. Okay, I, I would represent a fire EMS agency in LA County. Uh, my my follow-up question would be, um, what's the uh, average time for implementation? 
Uh, a lot of that's going to depend on your CAD vendor. Uh, who is your CAD vendor? Northrop Grumman. Okay. And and which uh, version of CAD do you have? Uh, we will be migrating to Command Point in the next six months. Okay. I know that a lot of that's going to depend on how fast they can turn it around. Uh, right now, uh, we're we're fairly booked up for most of the rest of this year. So uh, I will say that once you sign up, then and you and you and you've submitted all your paperwork that's required, uh, then we'll go ahead and try to and we'll work with your your CAD vendor to at least get the test side. Uh, installed so we can start the testing process. Uh, that's half the battle right there. If we can get you tested, if we can get through the test side, the test environment, and everything's lovely, then it's a matter of and them copying the interface over to production and then bringing it up. Uh, typically, uh, this can can span anywhere from 90 to 120 days. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Don, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute you again and see if anybody else has any other questions. Anyone else? Shannon, I know you've got. I know you've got a question. <laughs> Lauren, no. Oh, there we go. Um, do you still have a question, Lauren? Lauren, you're actually live if you want to say something. Oh, she might be on mute. <clears throat> Let's wait a minute and see if anybody else has anything. Okay. Okay. Um, if nobody else has anything, uh, Bill, do you have anything else you want to add? I just want to. I just want to expand on my comment about how much for the, like for the consultant. Um, if it is, if it is a, a really large county or a large city. Uh, that has to be evaluated based on, on population. So obviously the cost is going to be a little bit higher for that. But what I provided to you is just um, the cost typically uh, for like a, a middle, medium-sized city uh, and also uh, a small county that's not a metropolis like uh, Harris County in, in Houston. So I just wanted to make that comment. Great. All right. Well, if there's nobody else, um, we can go ahead and probably end this webinar. I want to thank everyone who uh, is still on the phone and are still in the webinar, and um, you'll be hearing from me soon. The only thing I would uh, really, really appreciate is if you're able to uh, fill out that form just so I have your – the biggest thing is to make sure I've got your, your population in your, in, your, uh, in your CAD version. That's – and. It, if I've contacted you more than likely, I already have a lot of your information. So um, other than that, you guys enjoy your Labor Day weekend. And Bill, thank you again. You're welcome. And, and we, will, uh, we will hope to hear from everybody very soon. Take care. All right, Bill, you're actually sending this presenter if you want to go ahead and close it out.